thank you very much. Uh, so, as it says, uh, I'm going to be exploring rural gym spaces and masculinities in an age of change within these cultures. Uh, so just to give you a quick background to the research uh, before I get into the findings, I began visiting gyms in working class regions of, of Devon just after I finished my bachelor's degree in 2010 and ever since then I've been visiting various gyms around the region and now elsewhere uh, conducting ethnographic observations. Uh, and this meant that really I, I got in at the very start of the current present trend towards the gym as being fashionable and becoming very mainstream. So I got to see something of a transition in some of these spaces between them being subcultural space specific to competitive training subcultures to now being becoming a lot more mainstream or at least influenced by more mainstream culture. And whilst in my thesis and in previous papers I've talked about these gym spaces as there's hardcore space, as in competitive subculture space, and there's commercial space, as in the more mainstream, I realized that actually, given the location where I was conducting it, there is a strong influence as well of rural versus urban masculinities in these, in these two different contexts. So I thought it would be interesting to explore the influence of rural masculinities and how these intersect with some of these subcultural uh, values. So Dave's Gym, I'll start with from 2010. A, a good anecdote to situate Dave's Gym and give you an idea of how rural it is, was one of the trainers there, very well-known guy, his nickname was Farmer John, Farmer spelled P-H-A-R-M-A, -A, because he's on steroids, but also he did work on a farm, and he would drive his tractor to the gym and park his tractor in the car park whilst he was training. So that gives you an idea of how rural this gym was. Uh, and as I've said, Dave's was sort of the, the epitome of the rural working class gym of 2010. So very cramped, quite old equipment and free weights, chalk dust in the air. And, uh, you know, where they did have machines, it wasn't the kind of fancy machines we, we see in the commercial gyms in cities. It was very much pulleys with some weights stacked on them. Uh, and at this time, the gym's makeup was probably about 90% male. There were some women bodybuilders visiting the gym. Um, there was a single, I think, possibly two competitive powerlifters who were women, but almost all of the, uh, the people in Dave's were men. Uh, and they were most, for the most part, in these competitive subcultures, bodybuilders and powerlifters, or they were, you know, doormen and other quite physical roles. Uh, so there was some sort of practical element to that training. Uh, and as I've said, uh, the town was a population of about 25,000 at the time. And 2010, this is coming very shortly after the recession, I began doing the research there. And uh, for a lot of men in the area, sort of the local quarries were the best work and that work started to decline. Obviously there was a broader decline, it wasn't just the recession, but uh, manual work was sort of becoming less present in the region. Uh, and as I've said here, drawing on sort of Branton Haugen's work, uh, there has been research tying rural masculinities with the undertaking of arduous physical work. And I think the gym, especially this type of uh, hardcore gym, can be tied in with rural masculinities. And this undertaking of this hard work is what, you know, quote, makes you a man. Uh, and some researchers have gone into this link between masculinity and crisis and the gym elsewhere, Klein and, and Monaghan, I've noted on the board. Uh, but I think focusing on it particularly in the context of rural masculinity uh, actually will be an interesting case study here. So exploring these rural masculinities in these gyms, as I said, doesn't apply to the gyms that happened to be in the area that were more of the commercial type. So there's a David Lloyd's in Exeter, for example, that obviously is not included in this analysis, but in these sort of hardcore spaces in the small towns, there was quite a homogenous uh, interpretation of masculinity in these spaces, construction of masculinity. So they were quite conservative in their ideas of what a man should be, and, and more broadly, uh, in terms of outlook at society, which you would see if you, you look at an election map, makes sense. Uh, but also these values of strength both in terms of physical strength, training specifically to be strong as opposed to to look good, uh, but also in terms of being disciplined 
and this was both self-discipline, as in if you didn't train hard enough, you would be accused of sandbagging and so on, but also a kind of cultural discipline where those who are outside of the subcultural values of powerlifters or bodybuilders would be sort of treated as outsiders. You were expected, if you were training in the gym, to be training in a specific way to fit in with the subcultural norms and values. And I've noted that that, in a way, is sort of classically rural, that sort of distrust maybe of, of doing things differently and, and everyone is expected to, to fit into a certain way of training. I also think it's interesting to pick up on uh, Eric Anson talks about homo hysteria and I think it's interesting to see how this is interpreted as you could say it's a feature of rural masculinity but it's interpreted differently by the different subcultures in these hardcore gyms. So for powerlifters this would sort of manifest itself as not wanting to seem overly obsessed with one's appearance to the extent that even they might go out of their way to deliberately not show off their physique. So you would see powerlifters wearing hoodies or in the picture obviously long sleeve and quite thick t-shirts but quite loose fitting so you don't particularly see their, their muscles because they wouldn't want to be thought of as I'm training to look pretty. As well as an avoidance of being seen as delicate. Uh, so I've got the example on the board of gloves which was a nickname that poor guy got, his friend brought him to the gym to train the first day and he walked in wearing weightlifting gloves and powerlifters of course don't wear gloves and it's seen as being like, oh you're quite delicate, you feel the need to wear those. So somebody said to him, hey gloves, and that just stuck, that was his nickname for about three years, people called him gloves. <laughs> so that's kind of the, the powerlifters manifestation of this desire. Part of being masculine is deliberately framing oneself in opposition to what's seen as unmasculine. And in bodybuilders, you can see I've got that quote, that's from Dave, the bodybuilder, shouting it at his training partner in the gym. I find that quote very interesting because his training partner was openly gay. So he wasn't saying it in a hateful way, he was saying it in a, that's what they're constructing their masculinity in opposition to as bodybuilders. Um, so I, I think that's very interesting, the way that you have these kind of rural values and masculinity and how they kind of come through in these interactions in the gym. And as I've noted, even outside of these subcultures, when you were in these hardcore gym spaces, the other men who trained, they weren't training for what we're now seeing in terms of fitness culture, wellness culture. It was more sort of, quote, gym rat types, and, and I've used the term laddish, which were, they were the guys who liked to go out to the pub and the club, and they just liked being big in that environment. Uh, so they might be less disciplined in terms of training than powerlifters, but still very much a kind of orthodox masculinity. Uh, now, as I said um, at the start, there is kind of this element of what it comes from the sporting, the subculture, versus what is the geographical, what is the temporal in the context of coming out of the recession versus today, and class influence is uh, obviously mostly working class gyms I was looking at. Uh, but I, I still think it's worth exploring some of the, the specific rural values, and I think this one to do with military masculinities and how the rural and the military sort of intertwine is very relevant, especially in South Devon because you have the marine base at Livingston, you have the um, navy down in Plymouth, so there's a lot of military influence. So whilst Woodward explores military masculinities as rural masculinities, I'm sort of almost exploring rural gym masculinities as military masculinities, going the opposite way. So the example I've put up on my slides to do with vomit, very pleasant. Those of you who visit commercial gyms probably would, uh, would be put off if there were people immediately outside the door vomiting. My first time in Champions Gym, one of the personal trainers puts me through a very hard training session to the point I go out the door and I throw up immediately outside the gym. The next session I go in, Paul's there, who's another personal trainer, and he says, Oh, I heard you were sick. That's a really great job. And I was like, oh, really? He says, yeah, we, we like to make sure that people on their first training session throw up because we know that they're going to work hard enough then. And Paul was a, a former Air Force trainer, and I realized this is very much the attitude that they've had training new recruits in the military. It's kind of bleeding over into how they're training young men in the gym. It's this same idea of masculinity, and you can see the kind of intersection between the military and the rural masculinities and, uh, and the temporal because as I've noted now you 
wouldn't really see that as, a, as an encouraged and celebrated thing in gyms today with the changing culture. So I think uh, gym cultures do give an interesting insight into the intersection of the rural and the masculine on a symbolic level. Uh, so that's, I wanted to explore the change in this now because uh, as many of you will be aware in recent years the gym has become quite popular as a social activity and it's something that a lot more people are undertaking. Gym memberships are at record levels now. You see these 24-hour commercial gyms popping up all over town. Uh, and this can be linked to sort of Giddens' work on the reflexive self uh, in modernity. And especially a few researchers have talked about the emphasis of social media and media more broadly and how people are now a lot more encouraged to participate in aesthetically oriented training and performance uh, and this is kind of coming in conjunction with the growth in wellness culture. So as the gym becomes increasingly popular we're seeing the impact that this is having on gyms in these rural spaces and how their values have changed since 2010-11. So the ideal that's kind of taking over in gyms now for men is sort of this, this Love Island type body or what Hakeem terms spornosexual um, where actually men now it's more about you want to have visible six pack abs as opposed to the powerlifters who are a bit um, more body fat and obviously more covered now being tanned, being uh, waxed and particularly being lean are a lot more fashionable and these are the messages that are coming through in the media and social media, but then we're also seeing that just as an increasing norm in gyms. So even though we still have these same rural, orthodox masculinity oriented trainers in gyms, we are seeing a bit of a transition as this becomes more the focus of particularly younger people, younger men who are coming into the gyms. Uh, and social media does seem to be creating this sort of globalizing gym habitus where nowadays young men are, are viewing Instagram and so on and seeing these types of images so there's no longer quite I think so much of the specific rural focus in the local gyms. So the impact that this is having on gym spaces I think is interesting. So this is Champions where this is the gym where at one time I was, I was vomiting immediately outside their doors and they have in about 2016, maybe 2015, they remodeled the gym to make it more in line with some of these values. So it's subtle things. They put in more mirrors and changed the lighting. There's much starker down lighting. They've put lighter paint on the walls. So if you want to take a selfie of yourself in the gym now, it's a lot more clear. Your muscles will look a lot more defined because of the change in lighting. So just small changes like that have brought it more in line with the type of commercial gyms, the 24-hour fitness type gyms. So it still maintains some elements of being a rural hardcore gym. Outside the doors, you can see a bit of light from where the door is. There is actually a, a, a grassed area which has tractor tires that you can flip. So it does still cater to that old style of trainer, but they have sort of made these changes to bring it more in line with current perceptions. Now, part of this change seems to be to do with women's use of gym spaces. And I think this, uh, this picture of a website, that's the home page of what was once one of these hardcore powerlifting gyms along the lines of Dave's. And now it's changed, so it's advertising you can be leaner, fitter, stronger is now coming third, and healthier. And they use a woman as their um, figure, their, their model, which obviously in the older value when it was kind of a, a real working man's gym, you wouldn't necessarily have seen that same imagery. And women have sort of transitioned in these spaces to some extent from being almost expected to train in the same way as men, but perhaps, you know, uh, almost inferior in that women lift less weights and men might talk down to them. But now women almost have distinct or, or not even almost, now have distinct methods of training when they're in gyms because gym fashion has changed as well. So whilst the gym is still masculine space, and uh, I've talked about that earlier this year in a paper, 
we are seeing a transition towards, in particular, I've picked up on this idea of performance of femininity in gym spaces, which you didn't used to see. So now women who go to gyms are wearing makeup, and because they are social media oriented, they're focused more on performing femininity as opposed to being, you know, quote, one of the guys. So I think that this has really affected both gender relations in gyms and kind of this uh, hegemony that was present for rural masculinities in gyms, which is now shifting. So I want to focus in the last part of this presentation on how men are navigating this change. So the first example is of Rex, who is quite resistant to change. Rex is one of the older guys, uh, he's about 40 I think, in his gym, and he's commenting on this trend now that suddenly there's a lot more young women coming to the gym, which there never used to be, and they're coming in wearing makeup and he's saying they leave an hour later looking as good as they came in after pretending to work out. And Elsa, who's one of the uh, personal trainers at the gym, she sort of comments on what <clears throat> you're not accepting that things have changed and the gym now is actually a social thing. So not all women want to come in and absolutely wreck themselves training. Uh, and Rex's response to that being, uh, that's exactly my point. The gym used to be the Iron Church and I don't like that it no longer is and now it is becoming this social thing. And as we can see, Rex says, uh, why should I have to accept change that's being imposed on me? Why do I have to accept a change I don't think is reasonable? So this is the first kind of reaction that uh, rural masculinity has to this change. Uh, and I've equated it to some of the perhaps changes in the economy in these rural areas and decline of jobs where it does feel imposed. And Rex seems to have that same reaction to the gym atmosphere changing. He's saying, I don't see why I have to change. So I think his resistance, in a way, could be seen as one manifestation of his rural masculinity. On the other hand, there's been some men who are sort of embracing and accepting change, and some who are seeing opportunities in it. So this is um, the same guy who was on the bench press in the earlier picture from Dave's. That's him now, uh, sorry, one year ago. He's now advertising himself based on his formerly subcultural body capital, which is now in demand in mainstream culture because it proves he knows how to train and, and build muscle and lose fat. So he's advertising himself on Facebook now and take advantage of the new popularity in the gym and this new shift towards the social media culture. And I've compared this to Brandon Haugen's work talking about forestry workers in Norway and how they transitioned towards the tourism industry and so their work is still grounded in the traditional competencies of rural men, but it includes these elements of service work and introduces some features of femininity and urbanity. Uh, so with this knowledge being commodified in new, new ways, obviously in the case of powerlifters, now they're taking their technical knowledge of how to build muscle and they're advertising it for the Instagram generation who want to put on muscle to look good as opposed to to be strong, but they're still seeing these opportunities. And similarly, I have a friend who was a strong man, a big guy, and he set up a, uh, a gym clothing company, sort of following on. So this, this is the kind of opposite way that some rural men are navigating this change, and I've just tried to tie that in with their masculinity and perceptions. So we can see that different men are navigating changes in different ways. For some, it's seen as, as a loss of what they once had, the Iron Church. For others, it's an opportunity for adaptation, collaboration, broadening of horizons. And for others still, it's literally just an opportunity to say, these are the elements that I like of the new gym culture. I'm going to appropriate those and carry on largely as I did before, as I think this image demonstrates quite well. Still training as in the old days, still using the free weights and everything but wearing a, a nicely fitting gym top. And, uh, and so I think it's very interesting the different ways in which we can see men navigating this change. But I think in all three instances we can sort of see this intersection between the rural and the masculine and adaptation to the urbanization. So thank you very much.
Yeah, um, I, I can. So I did a presentation on this at the Centre for Gender Studies in, in January about women's experiences navigating the gym and how it's still masculine space. And as you've identified, there are some issues to do with women are expected to stay on cardio machines as opposed to go to weights. And as you're saying about new barriers, an interesting finding I had was from one of the younger women I spoke to, Lucy, who was 19, and she said, uh, obviously for her coming up as part of this new generation, new culture, it is somewhat more accepted to be in the weights area, but then she was looking to do an upper body routine and was told specifically by a guy who she was in the gym with, oh you should be squatting because girls should squat every day because that's the best training for girls to be doing. So even though it's kind of, it's changed in that it's acceptable now for her to be in the weights area, it's still very much a, but you have to, you know, abide by, in this case, a completely different style of training to what the powerlifters and bodybuilders would have recommended because they would have said women should train their upper bodies for the purposes of their sports. So it's, there are barriers, but in different places now. So it's, yeah, that transition has been interesting to see. I'll just see if I can bring up Brett's quote, because I think that's actually quite relevant, if that's okay. Yeah, um, I, I think it is quite strongly linked with class in that sort of the working class atmosphere of the gym. Um, but some of, some of the portions of this, you can sort of see, he specifically starts off, the focus is women, because he's saying, well, they come in with the makeup on, and they, so yes, I would say definitely it is in relation to these perceiving the change of the gym becoming more feminized and women being more noticeable in the gym. And as, um, as you were saying about the social aspect, when he's saying the gym was the iron church, people came here to train, and there was the social aspect around it. So it was kind of the interaction of, yes, working class men coming in, training as hard as they can, and then socializing around the fact that they've trained really hard, lifted a lot of weight. And now it's becoming, uh, as you said, more feminized, and it's more to do with how do I look whilst I'm training in many regards. And yeah, I think definitely there is that, that sense of they've lost to an extent what they, what they had. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I can talk on that because, as, as I said, that's sort of my ongoing research project. Uh, there's different perceptions. I think it's largely across age boundaries for women in terms of what the issues are. So I think younger women, the main issue is younger guys who are now part of this like lad culture to do with social media can be a bit of a problem because they're quite obnoxious slash perverse slash just how they occupy the space when there's large groups of boys roaming around. So in terms of younger women, I think that was the key thing they identified. Whereas older women, I think it is more to do with just the intimidating nature of you're walking into somewhere that is you know, definitely masculine space and it's sort of those transitions from, as we were saying, the cardio section might be fine, but it's intimidating to walk into the weight section where there's a lot of big men you know, slamming weights down, whatever. So I think definitely there's there's good data. In, in fact, if you go on my YouTube channel, Dr. Luke Turnock, you can watch my uh, two presentations on women's experiences at the gym. So Thank you. I would recommend that <laughs> <laughs> to everyone. <laughs> Thank you very much again to the, the panel for answering the questions.